Hello, I'm Jan Leifman. Hi, I'm Gayatri from Elmen. Welcome, welcome to Med News Week Conference, where we feature presentations by Medicine School Believers. Today, today we have an amazing keynote speaker in Dr. Dori Segev. Dr. Segev currently serves as the director of the Center for Surgical and Transplant Applied Research. He's also the vice chair for research in the Department of Surgery and a professor of surgery and population health at NYU Langone Health. In today's presentation, Dr. Segev discusses the effects of COVID-19 in immunocompromised patients. Did you know, did you know that Dr. Segev was the first to demonstrate poor immunogenicity to COVID vaccines in the immunocompromised, work for which he received a letter of commendation from Dr. Anthony Fauci? He is also known for performing the first HIV to HIV transplant in the U.S. and was the first to demonstrate the survival benefit of incompatible kidney transplantation across the United States. He developed a mathematical model to facilitate a nationwide kidney pair donation program in both the United States and in Canada, and also pioneered legislative reform for the HIV Organ Policy Equity Act, or HOPE Act, which enabled HIV-positive patients on the current kidney and liver waiting list to be able to receive organs from donors who were diagnosed with HIV. He's truly a pioneer in the field of surgery. So let's tune in. Let's tune in and learn from this global leader. This will be a story about the immunocompromised, but first I think it's really important to think about what's happening today in the pandemic across the entire population so that you get a sense of the discrepancy between what most of us are experiencing and then what the immunocompromised population is experiencing. And when we talk about the immunocompromised, we're talking about in the US, for example, um, upwards of 11 million people in this country. So this isn't a very small group, but it is a very vulnerable group. So in the general population, and I'll say you and I, uh, you know, sort of addressing those who are immunocompetent with good immune systems who can count on our immune systems to protect us, most of us are either vaccinated or are convalescent, meaning we had COVID and we recovered from COVID. Um, and actually many of us are probably both had vaccines and then had some sort of breakthrough infection or another. We saw a ton of breakthroughs even in the immunocompetent during the Omicron wave. However, that said, and we saw this in the, in, in the Omicron wave, most people with this kind of immunity and intact immune systems are protected from severe disease. And we've heard time and again, Omicron being referred to as the common cold or something like that. Most of us, if we got Omicron or if we're looking, you know, sort of at a potential Omicron infection today, we're not worried about being hospitalized on a ventilator in the same way as what we saw prior to the availability of vaccines, because we know that for the most part, we are protected we are likely protected from severe disease. So for most people today, we're kind of back to the before COVID days. Um, I live in New York City, as you can tell from my background, which is not what's currently happening in the city, but is the view from my window. Um, and in, you know, in New York, the restaurants are packed, the clubs are packed, Broadway is packed. Um, people are walking around, eating, drinking in crowded spaces, dancing with no masks, and even vaccine confirmation has mostly waned. And this is our return to normal. Our new normal is pretty much normal. Um, and so that's where sort of where the general population is how the general population is seeing the current pandemic. Um, there are issues. There are issues of variant escape. So we know, for example, you know, the people who had protection from Delta and even who had Delta and vaccines were at risk of getting Omicron. So with we're chasing these variants with each new variant, there's going to be an escape of neutralization. So what I mean by that is, you know, let's say BA6 comes out and you have whatever immunity you currently have. If you're exposed to BA6, you may not be able to neutralize 
BA6. So you might get BA6 and you might be at risk of spreading that to other people, but you probably won't get severe disease from BA6 because of the broad ability of your immune system and the T cell repertoire that you've built up and the memory B cells and all this cross reactivity. They can high, they're highly likely to stop you from getting severe disease. So for the general population, variant escape is perceived as no big deal. There's also waning durability, and this is waning durability both to vaccination, and we heard this, you know, those who are over 50 in this country are recommended to get fourth doses after their third booster doses. And we know that after about two or three months, you lose neutralization from your vaccination. We also know that convalescent immunity or what some people are calling natural immunity also wanes and you lose the natural immunity that you, you got from you know, the, the Delta infection you had earlier or an infection you might've had in 2020. So there is waning durability of our, immuni of, of our immunity. But again, for the general population, this is perceived as no big deal. There's also reduced caution in the world, right? I just described to you the, such, the situation in New York, which was not that situation a year plus ago. So we're no longer requiring masking. Most places aren't requiring testing. Some places aren't even requiring vaccination. There are crowded spaces of people who may be harboring this virus and the new variant but again, it's perceived as no big deal because of the things we just talked about before. But is it really no big deal? Well, what does happen from this? If I'm immunocompetent, am I going to die because there's variant escape, waning durability, and reduced caution in the world? Probably not. But what's going to happen? What's going to happen is there are going to be more cases. We saw this in the Omicron wave, there were a ton of cases in the Omicron wave. The variant escape, the fact that we now can't neutralize the next variant means that immunocompetent people will get it. People with normal immune systems will get it, will spread it, won't die from it, but there will be more cases. The waning immune durability means there will be more cases. The reduced caution means there will be inevitably more cases. Are, no more, are more cases no big deal? Well, in the US today, we have about 100,000 new cases a day. And remember that the wave that scared the life out of us a couple of years ago was 60,000 new cases per day. So we have more than that wave that we were really, really, really afraid of a couple of years ago. And home testing belies this problem. So there are probably two or 300,000 new infections every day right now in the United States because of the new variants and the waning durability and the reduced caution and things like that. Um, because many of these home tests don't get reported to public health authorities because we don't have a really good way of following this and of reporting these and of those being counted, et cetera. So home testing is actually is creating for us a false sense of security with regards to our case numbers. Um, just a few days ago, the New York Times ran a headline that said COVID cases surge, but deaths stay near lows. And they quoted the thing we were just been talking about, which is that most Americans now carry some immune protection, whether from vaccines, infection, or both. And we see this even with the CDC's focus. Remember early on, the CDC was focused on reducing spread. So they would rank areas in terms of the risk if that area of spreading the virus. That changed completely. And now the CDC metrics are more like, what is the risk that hospital beds in this area will become saturated, that people will die, that there will be problems um, in the medical system because of some expansion of this virus. So we've all changed our focus from reducing spread to instead focusing on the fact that most immunocompetent people don't die from this infection. And as the New York Times said, most Americans 
carry some immune protection from vaccines, infection, or both. But guess who it is that doesn't carry nearly as much immune protection. It's the people that I take care of, the people that I've been a voice for for the last couple of years during the pandemic, the immunocompromised, the millions of people living about you, your friends, family, loved ones, people you don't even realize are immunocompromised. For the immunocompromised, what does this mean? What does the current scenario mean? It means there's more virus around. The new variants are harder for everyone to neutralize, but especially harder for the immunocompromised to neutralize. And the immunocompromised, remember, have had a poor immune response, a poor immune response both to the vaccine and to convalescent infection, which means somebody who's immunocompromised could have gotten Omicron, could have not mounted a good immune response to Omicron, and a month later could get Omicron again. And they have this poor immune response at a time where their immunity is even more needed because there's more virus around and the new variants are harder to neutralize. So for the immunocompromised, is this really no big deal? And I might argue that it is a big deal for this population. So that's where things stand today in terms of the pandemic and the role of the pandemic in the lives of those who are immunocompromised. And this is their sort of new frightening normal. Now, how do we know that the immunocompromised have a poor immune response? And this is where we begin our story for the evening. And I call this a story of a research study of 8,000 patients we never met. Because the fact that we're running research on people that we've never seen face to face is unique and is uniquely 2020 plus. We never ran research studies before this where we didn't interact with the participants of our research study. Why did we have to not meet the 8,000 people that were in our research study? Well, it's December, 2020. And the SARS-CoV-2 vaccines have come out and are expected to be miraculous and game-changing for the general population. The general population, those with competent immune systems, are the ones who participated in the big clinical trials for Moderna, for Pfizer vaccine, et cetera, et cetera, for the J&J vaccine. But the immunocompromised were purposefully excluded from these trials because the trials try to represent sort of the normative population and not the, you know, they tried to represent the 350 million people in the US and not the 11 million who are immunocompromised. So we didn't even know if they were safe, let alone if they worked in the immunocompromised. Why would they not be safe? Well, imagine you're a transplant patient. You take medication to suppress your immune system so that you don't get a rejection. We give you a vaccine. What is a vaccine supposed to do? A vaccine is supposed to rev up your immune system. It's possible that by revving up your immune system to make antibodies against SARS-CoV-2, your immune system might also be revved up for alloimmunity, meaning to make antibodies against your transplanted organs. So there was no studies that told us if these were safe for the immunocompromised to use. And then also when you're immunocompromised, it means you have a lower immune response. You need an immune response to make antibodies after vaccination. You need an immune response to broaden your T cell repertoire after va vaccination, et cetera. So do these vaccines even work in, in the immunocompromised? And we didn't know. December 2020 in the US was the height of wave three. This was a very scary wave. There were a lot of deaths associated with this. And if you were immunocompromised, it was dangerous to even leave the house, let alone leave the house, drive to a hospital, park in the parking lot, walk through the halls of the hospital to the research center, hang out in the research center with dozens of other people, wait in the research center to talk to a doctor or a nurse, wait there to get your blood drawn, 
come back a week later to do another interview, come back two weeks later to have your blood drawn, come back a month later to have your blood drawn, et cetera. That was too dangerous to do. So even if we wanted to use sort of our traditional research approach, we would not have been able to do so. It was also a prioritized rollout. So we didn't roll the vaccine out first to the immunocompromised, we rolled the vaccine out first to frontline workers, healthcare professionals, et cetera. And so if I were to do, for example, at that time I was at Johns Hopkins, and if I were to do a Hopkins study of the immunocompromised, December, I wouldn't have gotten very many immunocompromised patients. I would have only gotten healthcare workers, a few of whom are immunocompromised, but I wouldn't have been able to get enough patients to really make scientific conclusions. And I would have had to wait months and months and months before I accrued enough immunocompromised people in my study to get the word out. But we wanted to get the word out as early as we possibly can. And so we needed to reach out across the entire country in a novel way of recruiting people and engaging people with a research study. It was too fast and urgent for the standard, you know, traditional NIH funding timeline. For example, typically at the NIH, I submit a grant in February, I get a score in June, I resubmit it in October, I get another score in February a year later, and I see funding about 18 months after I applied for the, uh, for the funding. 18 months, we're in a completely different scenario. I mean, 18 weeks, we're in a completely different scenario. So even the accelerated funding timelines that were produced very rapidly by the NIH, many of them were still not fast enough to answer this question. We wanted to know within four weeks, were these safe in the immunocompromised and did they work in the immunocompromised? Because the immunocompromised were already being offered these vaccines. It was also too fast and urgent for a standard research approach. A standard research approach would mean that I invite, let's say I get five hospitals together. We invite all of our immunocompromised people to participate. All five hospitals need to get IRB approval, and then they need to get data use agreements across the entire five hospitals, which can take weeks to months to put together. And then we need to enroll people in person, and then we need to put them through the whole study, et cetera too urgent for that kind of approach. And I would have needed like 50 hospitals to work together to get enough patients to make early conclusions about this. We ran a study that we promoted over social media that in the first week of enrollment, we had over a thousand patients enroll in the study. So we had a high volume study that required multiple visits for symptom reporting, reactogenicity reporting, et cetera, and multiple blood draws to look at the immune system response to this. I will tell you that this entire study that I'm presenting to you was funded by one philanthropic donor that had the vision to do this. And without that donation, there's no way we would have gotten the funding that we needed to make this happen. And it was all done using a totally novel technology, based approach. So what I call research in the 2020s. This is an example of what I'm talking about. So this is the TAP2 capillary blood collection device. We can send five of these to somebody's home with an instructional video on how to use it. This is one of our research assistants demonstrating that you take it, you stick it to your arm, you push the plunger, you feel nothing when you push the plunger. It, it, push, it pushes like a couple of dozen micro needles into your skin. You don't feel those things. It draws out some blood by capillary reaction. It fills 200 microliters into that tube. You take the tube, you cap it, you pull this thing off your arm. You just generally don't even see any blood dripping from there, but you can dab it and it's done. You put the tube in the mail, you send that tube to us. We can study um, what uh, your immune response was to the vaccine, which is huge. By January, so December, the vaccines came out. By January, we already had safety data, which was published in a journal 
a couple of weeks after that. So by February 4th, so less than two months after the vaccines came out, we already had safety data. By April, we had safety data on two doses in hundreds and hundreds of transplant patients. We also had it. So I'm going to give you the data from the transplant patients, but there were also parallel studies we were running in the, immuno, in the autoimmune disease population, um, in the oncology population, in other immunocompromised populations. We determined that it was safe for transplant patients and other immunocompromised people to get these vaccines, um, and that the reactogenicity was no different than that um, in the general population, maybe even less reactive, and that there was no signal to indicate that it was harming, for example, the transplanted organ etc. However, by March, we already had data. This is what we called the Houston, we have a problem publication in JAMA. We already had data published in JAMA in mid-March that the immune response of those immunocompromised patients, and again, this is from uh, transplant data, was substantially suboptimal compared to that of the general population. So, 100% of trial participants had a lot of detectable anti-SARS-CoV-2 antibody even after one dose of an mRNA vaccine. Antibody was only detectable in about 17% of transplant patients. When we extended this to two doses and we looked at the antibody levels, it was pretty clear that for the overwhelming majority of transplant patients, they were not they did not reach antibody levels comparable to that of the general population. Um, this was quite similar in other immunocompromised populations.